All right, so we are dealing with a mirrorless camera. This is the new standard. This is the first professional mirrorless camera from Nikon. It has all the great things that you would expect from a camera, including interchangeable lenses, and the lenses are the aperture control. So that's our first way of controlling light. And then, messing up my graphics, they've taken away the shutter on this camera. No physical shutter. It's an electronic shutter, and that is going to be a hot topic throughout the rest of this class. So we'll talk a lot more about that. So the information is sent directly on off to the monitors, the LCD monitor on the back and the electronic viewfinder so that you can see exactly what you are shooting and exactly when you are shooting it, which is a big advantage on this particular camera. The shutter, the shutter doesn't have a shutter anymore. The sensor turns on and off to create its own shutter speeds of which we now have a much greater range, all the way up to 32 thousandth of a second, down to 30 seconds and beyond when you turn a special little feature on that I'll talk about in the next section. So we have lots of different shutter speeds, different apertures to control our aperture, and those are kind of the basics of how a mirrorless camera works and what the most important components are. Now, arguably the most important component is the sensor in the camera, the type of sensor and the size of the sensor. So. The size of the sensor, well, it's on the larger size. It's considered a full frame sensor, and that is because it is based off of 35 millimeter film, which was a happy standard for many, many, many decades in the world of film photography. It provided a convenient size camera with capabilities of making pretty good size enlargements, and that has carried forth into the days of digital. There are other size sensors that are larger and some that are smaller, and they're all good for their own thing that they do. There's a bit of compromise with any sensor size, but this one uses the full frame 35 millimeter size sensor that Nikon has become famous for over the decades. So for our basic controls, of course, we have our on off switch. Whenever you turn the camera on, the camera has a fluorine coated filter in front of the sensor that it vibrates to knock off dust. The flooring coating on there is kind of a really super non-sticky surface, slippery surface, so that things will generally not get caught on there. If they do, they can be knocked off. There is still the potential that you will need to manually clean your sensor, and so that is a possibility down the road. The shutter release for taking photos, that's a pretty obvious one. We have our main command dial in the back of the camera. So with Nikon cameras, the main dial is kind of the thumb dial on the right-hand side of the camera. The sub command, which is a secondary control, is on the front of the camera. So that's your matching front dial. The photo video switch is a very important switch. Most of this class, we will have it in the photo mode because we're taking still photos and learning how to work a still camera. But we do have the video sections. And if you want to put this camera into a completely different video mode, then you flip that switch and then a lot of the things change over to that particular mode. So that's an important switch to keep your eye on. The multi-selector on the back of the camera is our simple up, down, left, right control, generally used for navigating the menu system. You can move focusing points and change whatever is highlighted in the menu there. The OK button is going to be used for confirming changes that we want to make. So you'll highlight something by going up, down, left, or right, and then you'll press OK to confirm that choice. The sub-selector, aka the joystick, is going to be primarily used as a focus point mover, but you can also use it to navigate and do a variety of other things with it anytime you need to move around. So the sub-selector and multi-selector can be used um, either way for a lot of different features on the camera. Now it does also have a fully capable touch screen, so if you like using that, feel free to use it. If you don't like touch screens, not to worry, there's pretty much uh, dedicated buttons for everything else on the camera. Now this is considered to be a full bodied camera, which means we have a horizontal grip and a vertical grip with separate controls when you're holding the camera horizontally versus vertically. Now, if you tend to bump buttons like some people are prone to doing, then you can turn off those vertical buttons with the lock switch over by the vertical shutter release. And so if you are hitting that button because of the way you're carrying it or putting it in and out of your bag, or for whatever reason, if you want to lock those, you can turn those off, except for when you actually turn the camera vertically and start using it in that regard. So that's kind of a good simple trick for not messing things up. 
All right, Nikon buttons work a little differently than some buttons from other camera manufacturers. There's a number of buttons on this camera, the one circled, where you will press the button and you have to leave the finger on the button while you turn the dial. This is kind of a safety protocol so that you can't just accidentally press a button and have something happen. You have to do two things to do that. And so that works with the ISO and the exposure compensation and a bunch of other features as well. Now, if you don't like that, you're more careful. You're not clumsy in that regard where you need to have two fingers on the camera. You wanna do it more simply. Well, there is a feature that you can dive into in the custom setting menu called release button to use dial, which means you do not need to have that button pressed. You can have the button released and then you can use the dial to make that particular change. And this works like some other brands of cameras. Uh, so it depends on how you like your buttons to work as to how you might want to have this particularly set up. All right, the shutter release button, the most used button on the camera. When you press halfway down, it activates the metering system. And by default, because remember I reset my camera to the factory default standards, it also activates the autofocus system, which may be good or may not be good, depending on how you like your camera to work. It wakes the camera up if it's asleep because the camera will go to sleep and that's something we can control as well. And if you are lost in a menu system or you know exactly where you are and you just wanna get out, you can press halfway down on the shutter release and that kicks you back into the shooting mode. So that if you are, as I say, lost in the menu and you just want to get out, press halfway down on the shutter release and you're out of there. All of that is happening at the halfway step to fully pressing on the shutter release. Now, if you do not want your camera to focus by pressing halfway down, which is generally called back button focus, you can turn off the autofocus associated with the shutter release, which is something a lot of photographers have done over the years because they want to have separate control of focusing and when their pictures are taken and they might be moving the composition around so the focus point isn't exactly on their subject and it's a great way of taking more control of your photographs and so i've become a big back button fan so this is something that i like quite a bit and so i would turn off the af activation associated with the shutter release in that custom settings menu a6 however with the new subject detection Sometimes I do want the camera focusing with the shutter release. So this is a feature that you might want to turn on and off. It's an important one, one that you'll probably want to come back to depending on how you like to shoot your camera. All right, here in Camera Basics, this is the really important stuff, the file format. When you are shooting still images, you have the basic option of RAW and JPEG. And yes, I know a lot of you already know quite a bit about RAW and JPEG, so I'm not going to drone on about it for very long. But if you want to have full control and full editability, if that's a word, you're gonna to wanna to shoot the raw. It's gonna give you more tonal range if you wanna brighten up the shadows, you wanna control the highlights, you wanna work with it in editing, you wanna have that raw image, but the raw images are quite a bit larger than JPEG images, so there is a bit of a compromise. And I imagine that this is a camera that will see a lot of different people use it in a lot of different ways. If you're using it for studio photography, fashion, portrait, wedding, landscape work, where you want generally all that you can get out of the camera, you're probably gonna to wanna to be shooting in RAW. There is a variety of options of RAWs that you can shoot. This is something that we'll dig into a little bit later on in the class because there's three different compression levels of RAW and I've done some interesting tests that will show you exactly what you're getting with these three different levels. And that's why the file size can vary a little bit, uh, actually quite a bit, on, on how big these files are. So if you want to get the most, yes, RAW is the place to go. But I know there's going to be a lot of people who would shoot this in JPEG. I know I would for certain types of situations. Usually sports photographers or people shooting very fast action. And JPEG can be fine if you're careful about getting your exposures right and you know what the final use of your photos are. And so, you know, I have shot sporting events where I know I did not need 45 megapixels. 45 is a lot of megapixels. At one point, I remember Adobe stock images required 17 megapixel images because that was professional and something you could market. And I don't know that that's really changed. So you can set this down in size, which we'll get to in just a moment. So in any case, you can use these smaller size compressions to save file size if they fit your needs. And so you may need to do your own testing. I have not gone through and done the testing between basic and the star, which is a little bit better quality versus norm, norm star and so on. 
And so you may want to do some testing if you are going to be using JPEGs so that they fit your appropriate needs. Generally, a lot of photographers, depending on what they're doing, only want to shoot just to what the needs are for that particular job and it gets the job done. Now, you also have the option of shooting RAW plus JPEG, and this can be handy in special situations. Normally, I don't recommend it because if you have a RAW, you can make a JPEG later. This can be really handy in a situation where you want to collect the RAWs so that you can work with them later on and you want the best quality files to work with. But there is another more immediate purpose where you don't have time to make JPEGs of all your RAWs. You want it available immediately. And there will be ways of storing them on the memory card so that you can have RAWs on one memory card and JPEGs on another card. So you could just give that card to somebody else and they can go off and run off and do what they need with those images right away. And so I imagine that there's going to be a lot of these different options that are going to be used by the different Z9 users all depending on their workflow. But you want the best quality, of course it's raw. The camera can still turn out very good quality JPEGs that meet a lot of needs. All right, so let's do a little demo on the camera. Let me show you what's going on. So we're gonna dive into the menu right here. And in this first camera tab, we are gonna go down to image quality. And this is where we make our settings in here. Now, funny enough, the standard default system for Nikon is JPEG normal, which I think is a little odd. I would generally have it set a little higher for myself. Uh, you can move up to RAW and above RAW are all the RAW plus JPEG. So if you want two files for every picture you take, you can have a RAW and another JPEG of a different compression size. You can choose uh, strictly JPEGs. And if you're gonna shoot a lot of sports action or where you just wanna shoot a lot with smaller file sizes, uh, check to see which JPEG is right for you. But I think for a lot of people, you're going to want to select RAW. So you hit the OK button to confirm that that's what you want. And you will see it there on the right-hand side. So that's your first basic setting, RAW or JPEG. And then with JPEG, you have a lot of little fine-tune options. We will have some fine-tune options with the RAW. As I say, we'll address those when we get more into the menu system. Now, if you have chosen JPEG, the previous selection gave you different options for the compression of that 45 megapixel image. In here, you can control how many megapixels you are actually shooting. So this is the image size settings. Now within here under image size, you have large, medium, and small, which is 45, 25, and 11 megapixels. And I think we all know that there are certain events that just do not need 45 megapixels. The usage of the final photographs are just not gonna be there. If you need to save space on memory cards, speed up the workflow in one way or the other, you can size this down according to your needs in here. So this is one where it's very hard for me to make recommendations for what you need. I can explain how it works and the implications of it. You're going to need to be the one that decides what is right for the way that you use the camera. So those are our simple camera basics, not too many. And then after this, we're ready to get into the serious stuff. So thanks a lot for taking care of these little simple sections.